Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramnan and with me in the Bombay studio is Ritu Singh. These are the top headlines from the startup world. Danzo lost 230 rupees on each daily order during the first half of this year as its losses spiked two times to cross 460 crore rupees according to ROC filings accessed by Entracker. In FY22, the company's total expenses were 10 times of its revenues. The delivery charges are 2.6 times of the total revenue, giving them a gross margin of approximately 164%. The startup's revenue from operations grew over two times to 54.3 crore rupees in FY22. Baiju's revokes its decision to shut down its Trivandrum office operations after the company's CEO and founder met the Kerala chief minister. It also agreed to take back the 140 employees who were asked to resign last month. Baiju's in talks to take its physical tutoring chain Akash Public says TechCrunch looks to raise $800 million to $1 billion via this IPO. This could value Akash at over $3.5 billion, the report added. May file paperwork for the IPO by February. DealShare launches an in-house brand on its platform, looks to invest 500 crore rupees in its private brand's business in the next two to three years. 52 categories including home cleaning, personal hygiene, male grooming brands among others could be launched in phase one. Elon Musk announces an $8 monthly subscription for Twitter Blue Tick certification and other features, claims that the move is essential to defeat spam and scam on the platform. AI lending platform Upstart lays off around 140 employees as it faces weakening demand for loans in the US due to significant hikes in interest rates. The lending platform, which has about 2,000 employees, notified its affected employees about the layoff on Tuesday, reports TechCrunch. Google plans to discontinue its dedicated Street View app on Android next year. According to 95 Google, the tech giant has prepared a number of shutdown messages for the Street View app. In the notice, the company advised users to move to Google Maps or Street View Studio as the Street View app will end on the 31st of March 2023. Those are all the headlines in the world of startups, but let's start with what's making news today. Fintech lender Kinara Capital recently raised around 200 crores in fresh equity led by British International Investment and other existing investors. The lender hopes to use this capital to grow five times by 2025 and touch assets under management of over 6,000 crore rupees. Kinara, remember, caters to the credit needs of MSMEs and within that, subsectors like manufacturing, trading and services. The ticket size of its loans range from 1 to 30 lakh rupees. Joining me now is Hardika Shah, the founder and CEO of Kinara Capital. Hardika, thank you very much for your time here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, you know, uh, the number that you quoted in your press release, as of September, we understand you'd crossed about 1,700 crores in assets under management and you want to grow five times from here in just the next three years. What's going to drive this kind of growth? Uh, technology and demand is what's going to drive this growth. And of course, raising this capital from British international investments, along with Triple Jump and Nuveen, we've raised a total of 55 million, over 400 crores this year alone will, will fuel this growth. You know, this $90 million, I think so far you've raised about $90 million in equity, if you're not wrong so far. With the latest round, with British investment as well, how long will the capital suffice and how soon do you think you'd require more funding? Well, we are in the business of giving capital, so we are constantly raising capital to give capital, right? Yeah. And as we look at uh, our business, we look for an 18-month runway before we need to raise the next round, and that's what we'll be looking at here as well. So, you know, so far, uh, what you've done is raised money through private players. Any plans of taking Kinara Capital public at some point? And if yes, uh, are there some kind of milestones, uh, you know, internally that you've worked that that you'd want to cross off before you take the company public? Yeah, absolutely. An IPO is always a great option for, for a business like ours. Um, we are a retail lending business, so we definitely need to demonstrate some some size, some girth. So when you talk about that growth above 6,000 crores, that's right around the mark that we can start thinking about an IPO because that would be interesting for a retail play. Uh, Hartika, give us a sense of what your uh, cost of capital has been like, uh, you know, and what the trajectory has been like for you. Yeah, I mean, look, our cost of capital ranges anywhere from 12 to 14 percent. And definitely we have seen that reduce over time, even though there has been a liquidity crisis, as we remember all well, a few years ago before the pandemic. Um, with the interest rate hikes, there are changes and in inflections going on. However, overall, what 
good lenders are looking for are good businesses like ours that have been profitable for for seven years that are scaling fast that have a great capital base great investors and so our cost of capital is seeing a downward trend quarter on quarter all right so that that's good news for the company then give us a sense of what kind of dispersals uh, you know what they've been like uh, as of the latest numbers that you have and of course how covid had impacted business and to what extent has it come back to pre covid levels yeah, I mean, we are dispersing close to 200 crores month on month this year, uh, which is a, a significant shift from where we were during COVID or where we were, you know, through COVID, I would say. Uh, COVID was most definitely the biggest impact. It certainly impacted our customer segment, the MSMEs. And I know that there were so many programs by the finance ministry, by RBI to help with that. However, uh, when there is no demand for product, there is an impact and, and that therefore reduced our ability to disperse as well. But what we are now seeing is consumer demand is back with a bank. Uh, we see that in the, we heard that 1.25 lakh crores of retail sales this Diwali season. So that is driving a lot of credit demand. And we are in the business of, uh, of democratizing access to credit for MSMEs by providing unsecured loans. So our demand for our product has really seen a huge uptick this year. All right, uh, you know, but Hardika, the fact of the matter is that MSMEs were one of the most impacted because of the pandemic. Uh, give us a sense of what the asset quality looks like for you uh, and what the current delinquency levels are. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the MSMEs were the most affected. They, they, their, the impact was immediate. And, and, and what we see now is that those that were affected have had to close shop or, or close down. So there has been a unwanted closing or cleanup that had to happen because of the pandemic. But now the MSMEs that have survived, demand is back, they are back to business. Our uh, NPA levels, uh, you know, our NPA levels are around three and a half to four percent, which is actually a great marker for an unsecured business and the work we do. And and again, I come back to this because we have great unit level economics and we have been able to stay profitable through the last several years, including the pandemic. It shows not only the resilience of our MSMEs, but also the resilience of our business to to survive some of these shocks. All right, Hardika, we'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for being here with us on CNBC TV 18. Uh, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, on that note, uh, moving on, Y Combinator back Decentro is a banking and payments API infrastructure startup which has just raised $4.7 million. The Series A fundraise was led by Rapid Ventures, Leon's VC and Uncorrelated Ventures, a whole host of Indian angels also participated in this round. Now, the Bengaluru-based fintech startup will utilize the funds to scale up hiring across its business, product, tech, and operations team. Joining us now to discuss this further is Rohit Taneja, the founder and CEO of Decentro. Rohit, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You essentially help startups that want to enter the fintech market by deploying its APIs. Can you explain to us what this means and how are you helping add value to your clients? Sure, absolutely. So the number one problem that you know any company or especially startups face, right, uh, in today's market, whenever they're launching any fintech product or banking product, is the sheer amount of time and money they have to spend right, just to launch the product. Um, <laughs> and this is true across like the world, of course. We're starting from India as a first market, um, and the core reason why it takes so much time and money is because of the way the bank structure is run, right? The way the bank's processes are run. Um, yeah, it's just the tech documentation, you know, the API availability whole host of problems from a banking perspective. Uh, That's essentially what we are solving. Right? So the way we solve it is we integrate with the banks one time. It's a one-time integration with them, which increasingly leads to you know uh, a higher ROI from a customer integration perspective because they don't have to worry about the banking integration ever. Like We take care of basically everything end-to-end -end from ground up, including compliance, including the technology, including upgrades, including operations, etc. Yeah. Uh, all right. And post this fundraise, you all also have said that your valuation has jumped about 3.3 .3 times. Yep. Can you tell us what it is at now? Also, how do you plan to use these funds? Sure. Yeah. We're now at a close to a $40 million valuation. Okay. Um, the key use of these funds will primarily be twofold. One, we're hiring uh, across tech and business, right? So we're going deep into categories, the categories that we already own, uh, and there are some new categories that we're planning to crack. Um, 
few of the categories that we are going into will be on the lending side, on the marketplaces side, right? Few of these larger enterprises that we have not yet talked to. Right. Uh, that's one. And similarly on the product itself, right? So till now we were in the phase one of the journey where we were solving for payments, KYC, some of these uh, lower hanging fruits. Now we'll be going into more complex banking products like, you know, card issuance, account issuance, etc. All right. So some of uh, complex products there, but take me through what you already have mm -hmm. on offer. And uh, you sure. said what's in the pipeline. So where will the next leg of growth come from? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so what we have right now in terms of products, uh, the core product is payments. Essentially what right. we solve is your payment collection and settlements, right? So imagine if you're a marketplace, right? Um, you have a two-sided network. You have to get money in from the buyers and then send it to the sellers. That's one classic example, you know, of simplifying and automating pay payments via APIs. That essentially is the core product. Uh, built on top of that, the use cases multiply, right? So marketplace is one use case. You have gaming companies as another use case. Few of the other you know, common categories in the market, um, fintechs which are planning to collect money for subscriptions, right? Those are another use cases as well. Um, yeah, that's essentially what we have as a core product. Okay. Um, apart from that, KYC is a second standalone module itself, which is fairly useful for uh, you know pretty much any kind of onboarding of a consumer or a business, be it an SME or be it an individual. Um, and coming to your second question, you know how the next phase of growth will come in from. I think one is uh, we rely on top of our customers, right? So ultimately, it's a B two B product which is embedded into the customer's product itself, which means that we grow by default when the customers grow. So that's a beautiful model that we have here from a business perspective. Right. At the same time, we're also targeting, as I mentioned, larger enterprises and marketplaces which we have not yet tapped into. Companies which have been existing in the market for like eight years, 10 years or so, right? which already okay. have higher volumes. Yeah. All right. And speaking of your business model, your revenues have grown by over 35 times since your seed round in October of last year. And that's not all. You've mm -hmm. also clocked an average of 70 million of annualized API transactions over right. the last 12 months. So take me right. through the revenues you're currently clocking and what are the targets that mm -hmm. you've set for yourself going forward? Sure, yeah. Um, I think the key targets that we are looking at, um, at least in the next uh, 12 months or so, um, are on an optimistic note close to 4x, right? okay. at least 4x, I would say, of the current numbers. Uh, currently, we are clocking a little over $2 million in analyzed revenue. Uh, this is across primarily API transactions, that is our right. bread and butter. Um, and yeah, of course, you know, the key growth, as I mentioned, will half come from the existing customers growth and then the remaining half coming in from new customers, which are fairly large in nature. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and you're also looking to acquire licenses to launch in Singapore. So what's the mm -hmm. plan on that front? What's the expansion plan here? And how hard is it to get these licenses as you plan to expand going forward? Right. Um, licenses, like, I think the acquisition license is not an easy game, right? Um, it's fairly regulated, of course, by default. Um, at the same time, there's a capital requirement, uh, there's a compliance requirement. Uh, there's also a team structure requirement, right? So they go deep into what kind of management you have, what kind of you know banking you have, backing you have, those kind of things. Um, that's going to be a mode for sure, right? Uh, we will leverage these licenses to launch, as I said, the second phase, which is more complex products like account issuance and bank uh, card issuance. Um, in Singapore, we are starting first with payments. That's the core product, again, just like phase one here in India. Yeah. All right, and how soon will you be starting in Singapore? Oh, uh, pretty soon. In fact, you can expect an announcement, I think, in the next uh, yeah, month or so. Yeah. All right, all right, Rohit. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. We're completely out of time, but we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's uh, slip into a short break on that note. But up next, 20 Indian startups, all are portfolio companies of Agility Ventures, raised over a million dollars cumulatively at the recently concluded Jitex Global Event in Dubai. A special conversation with the co-founder, Prashant Narang, when we return. Welcome back. You're still with us on Startup Street. 20 Indian startups, all portfolio companies of Agility Ventures, a global angel investor network raised over a million dollars cumulatively at the recently concluded Jitex global event at Dubai. My colleague Aishwarya Anand caught up with co-founder Prashant Narang on the sidelines of the event to talk about how the Indian startups are making inroads into the UAE market and also about Agility's recently launched 150 crore rupee angel fund. We got the approval in January this year and we have already started investing from February onwards from that fund. So, you know, the, the check sizes, you know, vary from company to company, but uh, it is anywhere between 150K, 200K USD going up to a million also. You know, so that is, and we are sector agnostic. 
uh, we invest, uh, I mean, in good companies, good founders. Sector is, is really not that important for us right now. All right. Uh, but you know some of the upcoming uh, sectors that you would be interested to invest in, that you see uh, as, you know, as, uh, take us through some of the sectors that you see potentially emerging really, really strong in the coming years. See, one area that we have really been focused at is uh, health tech, uh, you know, and we are considering more companies. We've already made few investments in health tech. Uh, industrial automation is another. We have recently invested in a Web3 company. So, uh, and you know, FinTech is one area we have not invested uh, too much, but we are looking at, uh, you know, that sector. So, and, and SaaS. So these are few sectors which we are focusing more. So you have close to 35 companies in your portfolio uh, at the moment, and uh, one of the investments have been some, uh, like KidB and uh, Glamio Health. So uh, could you take me through, uh, and, and cross-border SaaS is emerging as one of the top sectors, right? So, uh, could you take me through how has the growth for the companies been and what value do you see in these cross-border SaaS companies? So, coming to our portfolio companies, uh, you know, out of these 35 companies, I would say more than 50% of them, uh, you know, have done pretty well till now. Uh, I mean, considering, you know, our investments are just maybe less than two years old, we have, uh, you know, companies which have shown a growth of almost 10x also. Uh, but yes, what we see is that you know all these companies that have raised follow-on rounds, they're not only, I mean, it is not about their valuations going up, they are doing some great business. And that is, you know, where I would say Agility's uh, role is to help the portfolio companies, you know, uh, get uh, access to business opportunities, to handhold them in various ways. And that is where these companies are growing. Uh, considering a question uh, around cross-border SaaS companies, so certainly we are looking at certain companies in US and uh, you know we are uh, at, you know kind of finalizing our decisions in investing in them so uh, we are you know looking at setting up in fact a US based fund uh, which is going to invest primarily in enterprise tech you know enterprise saas uh, being a you know core uh, focus area for us so certainly these companies we see uh, you know they have a huge potential because after a certain stage you know, it is their costs don't go up that much, and they so the you know the entire uh, VC industry has started focusing on path to profitability, and we see that you know SaaS companies certainly that path to profitability is uh, you know more visible than other sectors. So that is why we are focusing on them. But you mentioned that for SaaS, you're looking at the US uh, as a market. But what about India? What about the companies? Oh, so both, SaaS companies? Both, both in India and US. Okay. So All the right. US fund that we are looking at is going to focus both on US and Indian companies. All right. Oh, yeah, it's okay. a hybrid kind of a fund. Yes. All right. Uh, now uh, you know uh, you've just recently opened uh, UAE office as well. Yes. So uh, firstly, I want to ask that uh, what is the idea behind it? What are you looking uh, to do? Like in the uh, market here and also give us some of the interesting insights uh, from the US, uh, UAE market that you see. So you know when we came uh, last year to Jitex we realized that this uh, you know this is a world of opportunities in terms of you know the portfolio companies that we have. So not only from a perspective of raising funds from the investors here but also from a perspective that kind of connects that our portfolio companies can get not only to the businesses that you know are based out of UAE, but even global companies which have operations here. So this is a place where we can make those connects for our portfolio companies. So we, the purpose of opening the UAE office is primarily to get market access for our you know portfolio companies and also to reach out to the investor base here. All right. Uh, now you know I want to understand from you that. Um, uh, the fund, when we talk about the funding winter, it has impacted both growth stage companies and early stage companies. Growth stage companies in terms of them not being able to raise funds like they were before. And for early stage startups in terms of like, you know, not getting that kind of valuation or uh, not even that, uh, that, that, that large ticket sizes, right? So I want you to understand how has Agility uh, invested in the last uh, two years? Were your uh, strategy and when the funding winter hit, were your strategies different when you were investing in the Indian market as compared to the other countries? See, the strategy remains the same. Ultimately, you know, it is the business idea and the founders that we invest on. So, uh, you know, the strategy has not changed that much. 
what we have seen is definitely you know valuations becoming more reasonable and uh, you know that has in fact uh, helped us get you know these companies at better valuations which makes more value for our investors in terms of uh, you know the the companies we are what we have already invested in or you know companies that we are looking at what we are uh, advising the companies and in fact that gives us more confidence is that if these companies have got uh, you know a clear path to profitability with plans to sustain uh, you know with lower cash burn for the, this period you know if they are depending highly on uh, you know the cash burn and then only the growth so they should have alternate means of growing the business so if founders are clear on you know how they can sustain this funding winter uh, you know with the limited funds that they have i think that gives us more confidence to invest in them and stay invested okay on that note we're going to wrap up this edition of startups free thanks for tuning in but stay with cnbc tv 18 more news and updates continue after this break